Here we are in the Vellum chapter. And um, Vellum basically is a new to Houdini 17 and um, has recently even been upgraded in 17.5 and will probably continue to be upgraded um, in each continuing version uh, here on forward. But it is uh, a new sort of soft body dynamics, position based dynamics um, solver for Houdini. Basically, it allows you to do really fast cloth, hair simulations. Um, uh, it's soft body simulations and um, particle uh, simulations, much like how we did previously with the grains, uh, the grain solver when we were doing our pops examples. Vellum is like an extremely broad um, sort of area of Houdini, even though it is very specifically tailored to doing these types of um, simulations. It in of itself is so vast that you could almost have an entire course dedicated to it. I think that in uh, for our examples, just to kind of get things going um, as an intro, uh, we're going to just plow through a couple examples that cover sort of the theory of how vellum works. And then we'll do a couple more advanced projects that are, you know, example based and have uh, that we dig into a little bit deeper um, with uh, the uh, concepts and how to apply them for vellum. Um, so for what we're going to do right now, um, we're just going to focus on some basic cloth setups. And um, when I'm working in Vellum, one thing that I find is it's really handy to have that quad layout. So I did do a quad layout. Um, I did do a quad layout uh, in the intro section for the whole dynamics uh, part to this course, but I'm just going to go over it one more time real quick here. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down my alt key. I'm going to click this middle bar right here to split these to to pivot this from left, right from top bottom split to left, right. Then I'm going to over here. I'm going to click on this little downward arrow and say split pane top bottom and over here I'm going to say split pane top bottom. Then down here I'm going to add a pane tab type of network view. And up here, I'm going to add a pane tab type of parameters, like so. Then I'm going to right click here and choose one on the pin. And I'm going to right click this pin and choose one, right click this pin, choose two, and this pin and choose two. So now all these um, editors are linked together. And you'll see why this is super handy to have in a minute. So to get things started, um, I'm also going to actually, let's split this pane top bottom and add a geometry spreadsheet here. Let's close the scene view and I'll just bring this down a little bit. And again, if you haven't done this, you can go to save current desktop as, and then, you know, name it something. And for me, this is very close to my quad layout that I have. Additionally, I found this, uh, the games layout is very similar. You can see that it's got one and one linked here two and two linked here, and then a geometry spreadsheet and some other tabs down here that are relevant. The only other thing to note is that this um, symbol one is linked to these this view right here. I like to actually link this to the last selected node. So this, um, this view will actually uh, represent whether I have something selected here or in this network. So just a thing to watch out for if you want to just start get started from the games shell, uh, the games, uh, the games desktop. So anyways, let's uh, get back to business here. We've got to create some cloth. So let's throw down a grid. And I'm going to make this, just jump in here, um, frame it up, spacebar F. I want to make this grid a, let's make it a, a two by two. One big giant poly for our grid. So we've got a two by two grid that has two rows, two columns. Basically that just makes one giant primitive for us, which is cool. The next thing that I want to do is throw down a remesh because it, I found, and based off of the things that I've learned about Vellum, this seems like a really good practice to go forth with. Um, really what it does is it just, we're triangulating our mesh in sort of a random uh, like way. Uh, now I want to do a slightly smaller edge length here. Um, we'll just get some more polys. It just seems like it creates a more, um, whoops, I'm going to do 0 0.05. Just seems like it creates a more interesting and more believable cloth simulation if we're using a bunch of these little random kind of triangles like this. So that's good. Um, the next thing, I'll just throw down a null, and we'll just make a note here that this is the thing we want to send to um, Vellum. And then what we can do is jump up here, grab our grid. We're we'll just call this our cloth. 
um, initial and I'm gonna grab it go up here to the vellum tab and then I'm gonna click vellum cloth and it's gonna think about it for a second and then drop down a bunch of nodes for us so we <laughs> we have our cloth initial here then we have our auto dot network where it's do where it's set up our vellum solver and our cloth initial vellum objects etc and then down here, this thing called cloth vellum is where it's actually importing the data from the simulation and then we can save it out and cache it. Don't need to really focus on this right now. I'm just going to turn it off. And then I want to get back into this initial cloth setup that we have right here. Um, we can see that it has created this uh, vellum cloth constraints node for us. And the cloth constraints node really is where a lot of the properties for the cloth are stored. We've got um, mass, thickness, drag, stiffness, uh, stretching stiffness, bending stiffness, etc. So I'm going to just actually drag this over to the right. We're going to keep this around because it's really most of the actual properties that we're going to adjust are on this cloth constraints node. So um, with all those properties being on this node and we're wanting to be doing a bunch of work with, you know, forces inside of our top net, it's handy to have these both up because if we take a look at our vellum solver, our vellum solver has all these other things that are super handy for us. So like um, the settings we're going to want to adjust and use to polish our simulation are things like sub steps, constrained iterations. These sort of work hand in hand in a similar but different way to just increase the accuracy of the overall simulation. And same with collision passes, etc. Then we've got other things like friction, which are being controlled down here. Then on an advanced tab, if we're doing anything with uh, grains, um, there's you know very similar settings to what we had when we were working with our grain solver, uh, just the regular pop grain solver. So that's where that information is. So between these two nodes, really, cloth constraints and the vellum solver, we're going to get a whole bunch of stuff done. But um, in order to see this doing anything, if I just go over here and select a node in the vellum solver and click play, um, we just get some gravity. It's just pulling the cloth down, but there really isn't anything else happening beyond that. So let's give it a, a surface to collide with. We're just going to more or less set the table here. So let's just um, bring this up. I'm going to throw it on another geo. And we'll just call this like a table. And I'm just going to make a very simple table, which is going to be a tube. Make a tube, and I'm just going to uh, ghost other objects. just want to jump up here and see my initial cloth so I can position my table underneath it. So I've got my tube here. I'm going to just bring the center of this down slightly and it's radius in a little bit like so. And it's a primitive tube. I'm going to switch it to a polygon so that we actually get a geometry that can be recognized by vellum. And then I'll add end caps to it. So we have like a nice little surface that it can collide with. And I'll go down here and say uh, I'll add a null over here and call this the table. And then in our vellum solver, our, our vellum, our dot network for vellum, we will put down a static object and just grab this table and throw it into our SOP path here. Now, if I wire this into the merge and we click play, our cloth lands on top of the table and it's all looking good. Like so. I'm just going to turn on this real-time toggle so that it doesn't play back super fast like that. And I'm also going to hit the D key and do my usual, which is turn off the origin nomen and turn the background to dark. Because contrast, I think, would probably be easier to see in the video. Um, so that's looking good. Uh, we just see the ghosting of our initial geo there. I'm just going to uh, turn hide other objects on. So, so now we've got this, uh, this cloth falling onto our table, we can start messing around with some of its properties. So let's go and take a look at what some of those properties are on the vellum cloth constraints. So we can uh, mess around with the stretch stiffness. So right now the stiffness by default is set to 1e plus 10, which basically means 1 times 10 to the 10th or something like 10 million or billion, 1 billion? something like that. So it's some very extremely high number. If I click on it, you can see it's a one with one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. Yeah. It's 10 billion, um, 
a one with 10 zeros behind it. So that's sort of what that notation is. You can see that this, this when we drag this, it, it works on this sort of exponential scale where it just, um, it gets super high. It's really, we're, we're, we're really kind of dragging in powers of 10. So if I bring this number way down to something like one, and we go back over here and play our uh, simulation back, it should be really stretchy and crazy. And you can see that it is just stretching out um, quite far and really not probably what we're after for the, eh, I mean, yeah, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen all sorts of areas of Houdini abused for all sorts of crazy effects. So, I mean, if that's what you're after, go for it, you know? probably create some pretty interesting stuff if you dial um, a really low stiffness uh, amount around. Um, so if we um, maybe crank this to somewhere in the middle, you can see that it's, you know, just, it actually looks like it's it's getting a hold of itself pretty quickly here. So if I bring it back to these, yeah, it doesn't look like these cha these values are changing much. If I go into like maybe a hundred, let's see if we just play that back. hundred is a relatively low value and it's still doing that stretchy, but it's a little bit, it's, it's coming back a little bit. It's not co quite falling off into uh, forever below. Um, and then we've got this thing called the damping ratio. The damping ratio basically is going to allow us to um, dampen that stretching effect. So you can see if like I turn that on, it's still stretching, but I believe that it's just taking longer to get there um, because it's being damped so much. So if I dial this back up to a higher number and it goes down, you can see that it's taking quite a while to get down to that fully stretched out state, whereas where we were at default 0.001, it seems like it stretches out really fast. And these are all just little things that you can factor in when you're trying to dial in the look of your simulation. Because um, a lot of it is just balancing different attributes and parameters together to get the look that you're after. Cool. So let's just set stiffness back to where we had it, which was one EE10, or you can right click and say uh, revert to defaults. Or it looks like you can actually control middle mouse button and it'll revert to defaults. Um, let's look at the stiffness now. So the stiffness is by default set to 0 0.1, which is fine. So we play it, we get this sort of just a normal looking tablecloth like effect. If I turn that stiffness up to 10 and play it back, you can see that it's trying to adhere back to that original. You can see it's it's sort of acting more like a, a napkin on top of a glass or something now. And it's just, it's not wrinkling as much. Um, you know, it's just trying to resist the forces of bending in the object itself. So um, if we had, you know, say our we remeshed our grid to be a little bit higher res, I'll do something like 0 0.03 instead on our remesher. You can see it's much more dense here. These things are all sort of affecting, will all sort of affect actually how the vellum solver works. So not, you know, changing the resolution of your mesh might actually yield different results. Now, if I play this back, um, let's go back to vellum here. If I play this back, it's not looking like it has so much bend resistance anymore. I mean, it has a little bit. You can see it's trying to kind of flare out a little bit on the bottom and the sides here, but it's really not holding to that shape anymore. So if you wanted to create something like sheet metal, you might think that you could go into your cloth constraints and crank your stiffness up to like, you know, some insanely high number, like uh, whatever I just wrote, a one with many, many zeros after it. Um, and if you, you'd find that if you go into your, into your vellum object, and I'm just going to disable this and re-enable it to get it to work, uh, to get it to refresh. But if I click play here, despite all that stiffness that we added, it's still bending here. So, you know, this is where you kind of would diagnose yourself and what it is that you're actually trying to accomplish here and say, if, you know, I was trying to create sheet metal, well, I maybe don't need all, I don't need to focus on having so many polys. Um, in this geometry because it's really going to be bending at much lower frequency anyways, we could probably decrease this remesh um, by increasing the target edge length. So let's try something really high like 0.1 or maybe even let's go a little bit higher like 0.2, uh, not 0 0.02, 0 0.2. So now this is a very low resolution mesh, but if we go back into our vellum object and click play, it really is behaving like some sheet metal or something like that maybe a piece of cardboard or I don't know. 
so you can see like how the resolution of your mesh will actually affect how well um, Vellum Solver is actually able to calculate its properties. Now you could also mess around with other things such as if I were to go and turn this remesh back down to something like, whoops, not that. I'm hitting escape because that's way too low of a value. Let's put it back to something like 0 0.02, um, which is pretty high res, and go back into our Vellum object and click play. It falls down. It gets very bendy here. Well, one other way that we could try to kind of manipulate how well Vellum is able to solve for all these constraints is on the Vellum solver itself in the common uh, tab using these constraint iterations. And subsistence constraint iterations will allow us to get uh, more accurate results at higher resolutions. So we could crank this constraint re res iterations up to um, 1,000, and that might help us get a different result. But it might be, you know, you can see it slows down our simulation quite a bit. It might not be as e efficient than as to just lower the resolution of the simulation. And it looks like that didn't really help much. I mean, you can see that it is returning to its original shape much quicker. Um, but it still really doesn't have that sheet metal like effect. It's really behaving more like um, it, it's really behaving more like a rigid piece of or uh, sorry pliable piece of plastic or something like that. So maybe at that point you would also want to increase your sub steps. And you can see where now if I increase my sub steps to five, my constrained iterations to a thousand, it is taking quite a while for it to play back. It's going at maybe one frame per second, maybe one no half like might be two seconds per frame um, and then once it lands on that tabletop we'll just I'll just let it play through a little bit to see what it looks like it's gonna do I mean it's retaining some of its shape here but let's see what gravity does with it I mean it's really bending still quite a bit more than it would if it were um, if we were doing, uh, if we, it's bending quite a bit more than it did when we just simply lowered the resolution of the mesh. So, you know, it's just one of those things to keep in mind when you're optimizing your scene and stuff like that, that you could probably get away with um, maybe just changing the resolution if you're not getting what you're after, because you can always up res it in the end. Cool. So let's, um, let's just bring this back to something normal. So I'm going to just bring this back to sub steps of one constraint iterations of 100, which is basically the default. And then we're going to just, um, you keep the, let's keep the resolution. Uh, I'll keep the resolution to something like 0.25, something like that. I'm going to keep this remesh to something like, um, something easier to deal with like 0.05. And then we'll um, let's just uh, play around with uh, some more um, things on these nodes that we can mess around with. So I'm going to drop this again. It's playing nice and fast. We get a nice kind of tablecloth like thing. I want to just bring the uh, let's just bring the stiffness back down a little bit. So over here, the bend stiffness, I'm just going to um, right click and revert this to defaults. So we get just this sort of nice um, tablecloth like thing going on here. Cool. Um, so now, um, another thing that we could do is we could actually um, emit more of these from uh, into our scene. So if we go to this cloth initial vellum here, there are not too many parameters that I w ever really mess around with here. It's already kind of set this stuff up for us. But one of the things that I do like to play with is this emission type sometimes. So emission type right now is set to only once. We could set this to continuous. And when we do that, we actually get it dropping a whole bunch of cloths that are all, and it doesn't look like much is happening because they're all more or less identical, but they are stacking up on one another on this. Uh, you can see that they are all falling and stacking up. So just to make this a little bit easier to see, I want to vary the color and rotation of this uh, sheet every time that it emits. So let's do that. I'm going to throw down a color like this. And if I go into the color um, setup right here, I'll just put in a random. Um, based off of frame and we'll seed this color with uh, time multiplying it by 12. I'm just going to con hit control A, control C to copy that and we're going to paste it in here and I will change this value to 2, 3 and then in here I will change the value to 3, 4 and that will just guarantee a unique seed for each uh, for each dimension of the color vector. So now when I scroll through we you can see I'm getting um, let's go escape um, when I scroll through the color 
Oops, I accidentally collapsed that. Let's bring that back up. When I scroll through, I'm getting different colors every frame. I don't know why it's deciding it wants to sim this when I only have the color selected. So um, I'm just going to turn off the brain so I can really just scrub my timeline here. So that's good. Um, might have a, a display issue where sometimes the scene view is trying to show things that, it, that aren't actually there. Um, so I'll just disable that for now. The other thing I want to do is maybe vary the rotation. So let's turn on a transform and we'll do a similar thing. In here, we will vary the Y rotation by a random value that is seeded based off of the frame attribute times, um, let's do five, four, five. And that will only vary it by about one degree. You can see it's barely moving. So we actually need to multiply this by 360 degrees or some higher number, whatever, whatever suits your purposes. For, for me, I just do a random 360. So we're, we're generating all these different grids like that every single frame. So the next thing we can do is we can go in here and maybe say we only want to emit for like the first uh, second. So I'll go in here under the activation and this we can just turn this off if we want to after a certain number of frames. I'm going to do it using an expression like dollar sign $F, which is the other way of writing frame. And I'm going to say that dollar sign $F is less than 24. So anytime this is true, anytime the frame is less than 24, activation will evaluate to 1 and then it'll turn off like so. So I'm just going to go back and let's turn our sim back on. I'm going to click uh, an object in here, disable it, and enable it to reset the simulation. And click play. And you can see it's emitting all these different sheets for the first 24 frames. It's getting kind of bogged down because it's quite a bit of geo for it to deal with. And the, But they're all sort of stacking up on this uh, on this surface. I think what I want to do is to just make this a little bit easier is actually not have it emit every frame, but have it emit like every sixth frame or fifth frame. We'll do every five frames. So we can just add to this expression. So basically what we're saying is if if it is less than frame 24, uh, less than 24 frames emit, but we can also say it also has to meet this other condition. And the way you do that is type in an ampersand ampersand. So if it's less than 24, if the frame is less than 24 and the frame uh, mod 5 is equal to 0, so we use a double equal, so that's frame dollar sign $F modulo 5 is equal to 0. That basically means if it's on a multiple of 5, then you'll also be true. So you'll only be true when you're less than 24, and you'll only be true when you are a multiple of 5 or evenly divisible by five. So you can see now it's only emitting once every fifth frame. And those all kind of land and they do their thing and they stack on top of one another nicely. Now you can see that there is a little bit of a gap here and that is from the thickness. So we are determining the thickness of our cloth constraints right here on this on our cloth constraints node uh, right here is our thickness and we can actually visualize what that thickness is with little it'll instance little spheres onto our points if we select our vellum object go to guides and click this display thickness thing you can kind of see this is where it's determining our thickness and that's why those cloths are being kept about that far apart is because that's that's really the thickness that is uh, repelling those pieces of cloth from one another what we could do is we could actually increase the thickness on our own if we wanted to pretend like these were thicker pieces of cloth. So let's just see what that does. I'm going to go back to frame zero. I'm going to go to the cloth constraints over here and turn the thickness up to maybe, let's try, instead of 0 0.01, we'll do 0 0.1. And now if I go back to the vellum object and click play, you can see that it creates these gigantic constraints and then it kind of has to shrink them down a little bit because the actual thickness of these points is thicker than where they actually meet as neighbors. So that's just something to be aware of. If you really want a thicker cloth, you might need to further reduce the uh, resolution of your remesher. Um, so let's just, uh, I'm just gonna turn off the visualization of the thickness for right now and just sort of see how this looks when it plays out a little bit. Not too big of a difference. Um, I, it does seem a little bit slower, like it might be a little bit more for it to calculate a thicker object. So that's just something to 
um, be aware of. But you can tell like that thickness has made quite an impact in how far away this is actually um, starting to curve over here. So it is definitely stacking with quite a bit of thickness on it. Nice. I'm just going to turn this back down to 0 0.01. Uh, what we had before. And let's just take now a brief moment to take a look at what our output's looking like. So if we go over here, we can go into this cloth vellum. I, I'm going to name this something else like vellum export. And we're just going to take, I'm going to hide these and just jump in here and see what we get. So in here, I'm going to click the uh, play button and you can see that it's bringing, it's just importing in our um, geometry from our um, simulation uh, network and bringing it in here and then it's doing like, it's removing normals and then cusping, basically doing fong type stuff with the cloth, which is fine. And then we have a vellum IO here. This vellum IO is a place where we can cache out our our uh, simulation. So I'm going to just uh, maybe do that. We'll call this Vellum IO1 because we're going to be doing a few different examples of this. Um, I don't want to be caching anything and uh, overwriting it. So I'm going to be copying this setup over and over again. I'm going to have to remember to change that value uh, because it is writing our files out based off of the operators, um, the operator name right here. So um, here, what I'll do is I'll make a little cache folder. I'll call this cache hip slash cache slash uh, dollar sign OS slash dollar sign hip name. Um, and then I'll run, uh, I don't need quite so many frames. Let's just, let's just decrease the project um, length to, um, let's say 120 is good. And so that automatically updates this frame range and then I can click uh, save to disk. Just gonna think about that. And now once that's done, I can just click this load from disk and I get this nice, whatever, I can play this back nicely. Uh, the simulation is looking cool. Um, I think, you know, it's still pretty low res. If I was gonna do this in the end, I would definitely crank um, up, um, maybe to get like more um, intricate folds and stuff here, but for a simple example like this, this should just work fine. So let's look at this vellum post process. Now this vellum post process has got a bunch of cool stuff it can do. One is basically a smoothing operation. So that's what the spatial blur is. It's just smoothing things out. So you can kind of get these little, you get these little um, notches sometimes, stuff like that. So you can just uh, smooth that out a little bit. Then there's an opportunity to do some subdivision. So I'll just choose like loop and you can just crank that up and get super um, subdivided uh, geometry. Or um, I'm just gonna bring it back down to one, but then the other thing you can do is a, a collision correction, which is you can use this detangle um, to basically try to um, fix the little glitches that will occur in your collision. If I turn this uh, spatial blur back down, it looks like we may have had one. So if I look, uh, I'm not seeing it because subdividing actually helps it a little bit smooth itself out as well. But yeah, right here, there was this uh, little bit of geometry that's poking through. Now, I'm not 100% sure if detangle is going to work with this, but if I increase the number of passes, yeah, it doesn't look like it's trying to. Maybe if I bring this thickness parameter up. No, it doesn't look like it's trying to. It, it's not able to resolve that, but at least... Um, Using our subdivisions, we were able to fix that pretty good. Um, so the other thing down here is you can also do an extrusion. So we'll say extrude by thickness, and then what it does is it tries to basically extrude based off of the thickness parameter that you had to um, get a cloth that represents, you know, get a, a add thickness to the cloth in a way that represents the original geo, uh, the the actual collision geo, the collision thickness. So. You get something like this and then from here you could just you know cash this out and that's sort of where you're at for this type of simulation now we could go back i honestly there's tons of things that i would change about this i would make these cloth i would make the cloth uh way higher res if i was really trying to do something like this but just for an example to kind of show you what the parameters in the cloth are doing um this works just fine so let's do another setup now what I want to do is uh, kind of play around with um, some constraints. So this is going to be the, this sim was dedicated to doing just sort of a cloth 
properties. And I'm going to just go back to uh, frame zero. I'm going to hide everything. And then if I just grab all of these nodes and I hold down the Alt or Option key and just drag them off to the side, it creates a copy of everything, but everything's internally referenced. For example, this node, this vellum export, is now, if we look at our DOP geometry, it's actually looking at cloth properties one. Cloth properties one, if we go over here, is this new one that we calculate or that we uh, copied over. So really one of the cool things about this is if you copy all the, whatever nodes you grab and copy, they will maintain their internal referen relative references um, when you copy them over. Um, so for example, if I delete this and if I delete this and I just copy vellum export uh, over, and dive in it, you can see the DOP geometry is actually still referencing that initial cloth properties object. The DOP network is set to cloth properties. But now, it was, so really it's referencing everything that led up to this point, it will continue to reference. But if I just grab all of them and option drag them over, we get updated references to the new DOP object, which is really handy when you want to just keep iterating through setups so that you don't want to deal with takes or anything like that. So here, um, I can rename this. We're going to call this one cloth pin. And we're not going to need the table for this one, but we're going to jump into the cloth initial setup and change some things about it. The other thing I'm going to do now that we've set up this new one is I'm going to go over here and let's just get in. So we're both on object level here. Um, don't want to be confused. One thing that can be confusing is maybe one of these would set on old um, setup and you're making changes and nothing's happening in your dot net. Um, that can be a problem. So it's just something to be aware of is that you might be changing the wrong settings on the wrong nodes if you're not 100% sure of, you know, where you're actually at. So this, um, this uh, this dot network right here. I'm just going to dive inside it. This is the static object is giving us an error because I deleted the table, so we're going to delete that. Don't need it for right now. What we actually want to do is use a pin constraint to get our cloth to uh, you know just to hold down one of the edges of our cloth. So let's go back into cloth um, initial over here, and we don't need this uh, color or rotation either. So I'm just going to um, let's just delete that. So what I want to do is pin down some of these, one of these edges, and we'll kind of make like a, a waving flag type thing. So I'm going to throw it on a group, and the group we can set the group to points. I'll call this group the pin group. So we're going to pin points, and it, you can name this group anything you want. You'll see we can specify it later down here in our cloth constraints. But if I um, go to keep in bounding regions and enable this, I'll just set my bounding region to be just kind of um, uh, around one of these edges. So you can see if I just kind of drag this off to the side, we get this nice orange row of points. Let me just hit the D key and go to, I'm just going to change this to make it a little bit easier to see. Uh, like that. There we go. So you can see I've got this nice group of points that are now in my pin group. Um, if I go to the vellum exp, uh, the cloth pin, um, adopt network and click play. Oh, it's still actually emitting my pieces of cloth. I don't want that. I just wanted to emit the cloth once. So I'm just going to right click delete channels on here and set it to activation to one and emission type to only once. And we go back and we just have our cloth dropping under the forces of gravity like we were like we did before. So I'm also the, the, the in order to get this to pin, I got to go into the con cloth constraints node. And just go down here. You can see it says pin to animation here. We can just choose which pin points we want by specifying a group here. So if I pick this drop down here, you can see that pin group I created shows up. So if I click that, and then we go back over here to our vellum object and click play, you can see now that that is sort of, uh, it has pinned those edges to, um, it has pinned those points in place. They're not moving and everything else is sort of staying attached like that. Um, so we could add a little bit of, maybe let's add some wind force here. Uh, we'll use a pop wind and I'll set the value to something like maybe one in, let's see what direction, one, negative one in the Z direction. Um, based off of this, that should be blowing from left to right the way that we're looking at it right now. Um, so let's go back here and click play. 
you can see that it's adding a little bit of wind. It's not fully able to come all the way down. Maybe what I'll do is add a little bit of amplitude to the um, noise function that's going through there. Maybe we'll just increase the, the velocity of the wind to negative, um, negative two. See if that gets us more of a flag-like effect. And it's looking pretty close. I think right now, really, what we've got, the, the main issue that I'm having with the way that this looks is that the resolution isn't high enough for it to really, truly look like a flag. But this is just a quick example, so I'm not going to worry about that too much. So what if we wanted to animate this, uh, animate those constraints and move them around? Well, what you could do is uh, maybe you'd think, throw down a transform node over here. Um, you know, in our stuff that we're sending to Vellum, we'll just put it right above um, the two Vellum null. And then maybe what I could do is set a keyframe on the rotation here and then go back out to, oh, I'm going to hit escape and I'm going to turn off the brain down here and go out to frame 24 and maybe rotate it um, negative 90 degrees in Z. And then I'll just option click that as well to, um, or alt click that as well to get it to rotate like that. So you'd think like I've got these points and now they're being transformed. So Vellum should pick that up, right? So if we go back here into Vellum, I'm just gonna turn the brain back on, control click the brain to reset the simulation and click play, nothing happens. And it's just one more checkbox we need to do in our cloth constraints, which is the pin type is set to permanent. That's good. We just want to click this match animation and then it will update every frame uh, depending on what these points are doing. So now keep in mind, it's only, even though we're animating all the geometry, the only points that it really cares about is what the pins are doing. But because the pins are a part of this whole geometry, it's going to um, react accordingly. So if we go back over here, going to control click the brain and click play. Oops, and I don't have a node in my vellum selected, so I'm going to just select one of these nodes over here and click play. You can see now we are we have animated that uh, row of constraints to be vertical. Great. So what if we wanted to actually animate both of these, uh, like two edges, differently? Maybe we want to twist this uh, cloth around. So let's try and set that up. The way I would want to do it is maybe set up another pin group, but I want this pin group to be different and I want to translate it differently. I want it to twist in the opposite direction. So maybe what I could do is let's just go down here, maybe add another group that's on the other side. So I'll just, I'm going to op, alt drag the pin group off to the side and then I'm just going to move it over. So it's encapsulating this last row of points over here. So I'll just rename this group. Um, well, I could rename this group um, like pin two. And then um, if I wire this in here and go down to my cloth constraints, I could select pin two as well from that list and it just adds it to the list, which is cool. So now if I go back to the sim and click uh, play, you can see those two are, um, these two, if we play back our vellum sim are pinned together. But now I can't, animate them in opposite directions. Um, you know, we could add, we, we could have added, um, you know, more, more points to pin one by just like creating another pin one group and then saying union with existing, but I created a separate pin two group because I actually want to control this pin group separately. So because this transform right here is being applied to the entire object, we could actually create a separate transform that is being only applied to these pin two, this pin two. So I'm just going to actually insert, insert those right after pin two, uh, insert a transform. So here we go. And here I could actually have this maybe rotate in the opposite direction. So let's just grab this rotation right here by right clicking copy parameter. And in this one, I'm going to say, um, paste relative references. So I'm right clicking in the Z, tra uh, Z, Z channel and saying paste relative references. And I'm going to set this group to only pin two. And now it looks kind of funky, but this transform is rotating at negative 90 degrees. And then that is being copied onto this transform, which is also rotating it just by the same amount, negative 90 degrees, but, but it's sort of additive now because we haven't changed this appropriately. So if I just negate this, actually, what it's going to be doing is it's going to be doing the exact opposite of what 
this transform node is doing. Basically, it looks like it isn't moving anywhere. So maybe I'll just double that. So it's going to move in the opposite direction of the other one, but twice as much. So now, when you see this, one of them is rotating um, counterclockwise. This, this original pins is moving counterclockwise. And while it's doing that, this new pin, uh, this pin 2, is moving um, clockwise. In the opposite amount. So what we could um, now do is because we've got both these uh, constraints pinned, we could go over here and let's check out what it's doing in vellum. It's actually twisting that cloth for us, which is cool. So you could actually um, animate this further and say, what if we want this cloth on the right to continue? Um, maybe what I'll do is just set this I'm just going to delete the channels here, and we'll go back to frame one. I'm going to turn off the brain. I'll set a keyframe here of zero, and I'm going to alt-click in there to set a keyframe at zero. And then maybe we'll go out to frame 70. No, let's go to frame 96, and I'll continue to rotate this all the way to 360 degrees. So it should make one full. So as, as we look at this, This one is going to be rotating left, and this one is going to continue rotating right for a full 360 degrees. Um, and it's going to create kind of an issue. We'll see in a second here, and this is where we it comes into you got to do a lot of troubleshooting with constraint iterations and collisions and stuff like that. But if we rotate this, you can see it rotates, and then this one on the right starts rotating, and it looks really cool. It starts twisting, and then bleh, it just all falls apart and uh, goes back to this kind of glitchy, non, uh, not what we're after type of look. So what can we do to fix this? This is where it comes in handy to be using uh, all sorts of like sub steps, constraint iteration type things on this, on this Vellum Solver node. So some things that I did were, first off, um, is the, twisting this much is adding a lot of stress on these horizontal pieces. So I think what I'm actually going to do is um, bring down the scale of these pins as well as they twist. So they're going to come. They're going to come a little. They're going to become a little bit narrower. But um, the other thing I want to do is just increase the collision passes. So it's. I mean, this is a collision issue that it's having. It's causing self penetration because it is not does not have enough info to calculate those collisions. So. First, first thing I might do is, you know, try and cl crank up these coll collision passes. So let's go back and see what we get now. It's going to run a little bit slower, but hopefully it starts to help um, the whole thing act a little bit more stable as well. You can see that by now it's still holding pretty good, but it still gets a little bit gnarled up. It's not 100%. Um, yeah, it's still starting to fall apart. So I think like this is where I would, you could continue to try and crank this as far as you possibly can. But I think for what I might do is actually go into this transform and just scale everything down a little bit. So if we go back to frame zero, what I want to scale is this, this, I want to scale along or perpendicular to the axis that it's rotating. So maybe we'll start out here at a scale of one. And then over time, We'll just rotate this in, and then we'll just scale down like so to a value of 0.5. So over over a little while, it's going to actually compress these constraints on the end and give it a little bit more slack so it isn't so tempted to self-intersect. Let's see what we get with that. You can see it's ruffling up here and getting nice and... Um, kind of uh, curtainy look to it. Oh, this guy's spinning. And we're getting a nice cloth twist here. And it looks like we made it through without any um, without any issues. Um, and then, you know, be, this being all GPU accelerated and everything, really, you would want to actually crank this resolution up and you could get something really fancy. You might need to increase your sub steps, constraint iterations, collision passes, etc. But you can really get some amazing looking cloth twisting and manipulation like effects through this. So just to um, go back out to our 
our export and see what we can get just based off of this low res. Um, this Vellum IO is actually picking up the old uh, sim that we did. I don't want that. I'm going to just uh, turn load from disk off. So it's actually importing our geometry now. And I don't really want to look at any extrusion by thickness yet. I'm just really kind of seeing what I can do to clean this up using just Vellum post process itself. So uh, it's, it's subdividing it for us. That's good. Um, we might want to add like a little bit of blurring. Um, but if I turn off the wire shaded and just look at this, you can see that it's getting, it's getting there. Um, maybe more spatial blur would smooth that out a little bit. And I don't think additional subdividing was really going to do too much. But at this point, I'd really say um, you should probably just crank th this, uh, crank the, um, uh, what is it? The uh, remesh values down a little bit lower. So let's just try that. Hopefully this doesn't take too long, but I'll just bring this down to uh, point, uh, point zero two five. So that's having it. Um, and let's see what we get now. I'm just going to, I want to turn back on smooth wire shaded. Um, helps me to see that a little bit. Um, and let's see, let's go into the cloth pin sim and let's play that down. Because this is running so slow, relatively speaking, I mean, it's running fast in general, but it's uh, taking a bit. I'm just going to cache it out because I don't want to have to um, deal with it accidentally running out of memory there. So let's go into the Vellum export. And I'm going to change this to Vellum IO2 just so I don't overwrite that other um, cache that we wrote. And I'm just going to hit, um, I'll turn on load from disk and hit save to disk. That ended up taking a couple minutes, so I just decided to cache that out. Um, but let's look at what we got. You can see that um, this is our this is the Sim Geo, so we just increased that resolution a little bit, and it's already starting to look better. And the gains of that, and you can see that the wind is actually the turbulence is blowing it around a little bit too, which kind of looks funky. I might dial that back a little bit if I was doing it in real life. Um, not real life, but if I was doing it on a real uh, project, but um, now when you post process it, you can see you get this high, nice, these nice uh, folds like this. I really love those. Um, and it starts to look pretty cool. Um, let's just, uh, let's check on this. Um, one, so one thing that happens with vellum is, or with cloth sims in general, is it ends up kind of looking a little bit lumpy, I find in the end. Um, so even though we are doing a little bit of this, spatial blurring you can see the effect that that's kind of having on our cloth like that um and we we are subdividing it as such um if i just turn off these smooth water if i turn it on to smooth shaded it still looks like it's got i don't know see these little like lumpy artifacts in it and really um over smoothing it is going to actually decrease how realistic the cloth itself looks if i turn the spatial blur up to like three um, I don't even think I can go up to three. What we could do is add our own smoothing to this after the fact. Let's do, um, let's use a Delta Mush. I'm going to throw a Delta Mush in here and continue to increase this. Um, maybe I'll bring the step size down, but the iterations up to like a hundred. Yeah, that looks good. And then I'll just recompute the normals. So I'll put down a normal. It's like over smoothing your cloth will still create issue its own issues. Like it looks super smooth right now. I mean, you're still seeing lumps here, but um, you can get some self intersections and stuff like that. So really, you're going to want to just continue to push this and increase the resolution of your input cloth if you can. Um, but for a lot of uh, a lot of situations, really, um, it doesn't. You can get away with a lot. Um, you know, in terms of. You know, once your textures are on there and you've got some nice knitting pattern on there or something like that, you won't really need all of this extra detail and you can get some pretty cool looking um, fabric twists based off of, uh, <laughs> I, like as if fabric twist is like the number one thing you're going to do with this. You can get all sorts of cool effects that will look very cloth like in the end without, without too much, um, you know, extra messing about. Cool. So the next setup I want to talk about is how we could tear cloth. So I'm actually going to, what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing we did last time, which is modify this setup. So I'm just grabbing all the nodes of the cloth twisting setup and I'm just going to alt drag them off to the side and it'll think about it and create a whole new network for us. 
Um, first thing I'm going to do while I'm thinking about it is I'm going to dive into the Vellum export two, and I'm going to just rename this Vellum IO three, and so that I'm not overwriting those cache files from the previous example. Um, you could overwrite them. Honestly, these are just very basic examples, but just just to make note that you don't want to kind of delete uh, overwrite things if you're if you're trying to save on to them. So. Now let's let's set up a nice tearing setup. We've done this whole twisting thing, which is cool. We can actually use these two pins to just pull this cloth apart instead of um, twisting it. So let's um, modify these transforms here. We've got our um, we've got our our transform here. Let's just focus on this one. I'm going to turn off the transform for pin two. I'm going to name this actually so we can keep track of it. This is pin two transform, and then this one is overall transform. So our overall transform, we don't want to twist it anymore. I'm not really interested in doing that. So let's just turn the um, rotation off. I'm going to Control Shift and Left Mouse Click Rotation, and I'm also going to Control Shift and Left Mouse Click Scale. So really, we've just reset this. It's not doing anything. Um, and what we want to do is just rip it apart. So let's just set a keyframe at frame zero in the Z axis by Alt clicking there. And then we'll go out to frame 72 and just drag this cloth off to the left by, say, one, one meter. Um, and then what we need to do is just apply the opposite motion to the pin. So I'm going to just right click and copy this parameter. And I'm going to paste it into, well, I got to delete this rotation as well. So I'm going to control shift click this and reset it to zero. Then in the translate Z, I'm going to right click paste relative references. Again, that's because I copied the relative references from here. So overall transform, right click, copy parameter. Over here in this transform, right click, paste relative references. Like so. so I've got the overall transform. Now if it's if I if I activate this, it's just going to do the same thing that um, this one's doing, but it's adding on to it, so it's just sort of intersecting. We actually want it to go in the opposite direction, like we did with the rotation, but times two. So if we just do negative, it'll just stay where it was, because it's just directly counteracting this motion. But if we multiply this whole thing by two, it will mirror it. So now we are stretching this piece of cloth out. And if I turn on the smooth wire shaded, you can see that it's really just that edge of polys and then all these are getting ripped up. Um, well, they will be getting ripped up, but they're, it's all gonna be compensating in the end. So if we go, let's just see what this gets us with our vellum sim. I'm going to, um, see now this is tricky. I've got my cloth initial two on the left and my cloth initial one on the right. I'm just gonna hop out here and make sure this is cloth initial two here and I'm going to put my vellum sim on the left. So when I play back vellum, it's taking those constraints and it should start anima animating them away. I'm actually going to um, also increase the resolution of my remesh so that I, or decrease the resolution by increasing the target edge length so that this goes a little bit faster. And let's go back here and uh, click play and we can see our constraints pulling this cloth apart and it's starting to stretch but it's not going to break yet we got to get it to break so we can do um, we can add our own little tears here I think it would be nice to have a nice little tear going down the middle so let's um, let's go over here and tear that cloth we've got our, our remesh here maybe we'll just do it right after our remesh so the, the node that I want to use to do this tearing is called Edge Fracture. So let's throw that down and wire it in here. And highlight it, and it looks like nothing is happening. Um, but you can see that it's generating 10 pieces here. What I could do is throw it on, let's see if Exploded View works. So Exploded View, we can visualize those pieces that it's tearing. Uh, if I just crank that away, you can see that's where all of our tears are in this geometry. So if I um, now were to go back to the vellum object and click play, um, our constraints are holding those pieces, but any piece that wasn't really 
um, attached to one of those constraints is now in free fall and there really is no way for it to, um, there's nothing really holding it together saying like, Hey, you know, I want you to remain connected, but then tear apart as the, uh, stress of stretching, uh, increases. So we, we just need to add some more constraints to the network in order for that to work. So if we go back down here, um, after, uh, our, let's say after our cloth constraints, we'll just throw down a vellum weld. The vellum weld points, we'll just wire that in right here. You can see that it wires these two guys through as well. And we'll go back here and let's just, um, I'm going to turn off the exploded view and just go here. You can see that the vellum weld has actually welded these points all together for us. So let's play back now. Going into our vellum object, you can see everything's kind of staying together. And then as we start to stretch, these welds should break. But they don't um, because I forgot to set one setting, which is down here at the the end of the vellum weld, there's a breaking tab. So let's just turn on this breaking uh, checkbox that will allow those welds to um, break after they receive um, stress at a certain threshold. So if I click play now, oops, that's playing over here. I just got to select something in my, again, in my vellum network or in my simulation network. You can see that some tears are starting to happen around the edge here, and then they're starting to happen in the middle, and then eventually they all tear apart. Um, but it's happening a, it's happening pretty quickly, and it's also happening all the way out to these edges. And really, I just want a tear that goes right down the middle. So how could we do something like that? Well, this edge fracture is super art directable. It's got this second input here, which is asking for fracture curves. So we could actually supply our own curves in which we want to fracture. So let's create some. I'm just going to go and hit spacebar 2 so that I'm framed in my top view. And if I click play, you can see that actually the, the stretching is occurring vertically. So I'm going to want to draw some lines that go down the middle here to um, sort of art direct where our um, fracturing or tearing is going to happen. So let's go and create a curve node. And put it right here, and I'm just going to go back to frame zero. And I got my manipulator selected. I'm just going to draw a nice little tearing pattern through the middle like that, and hit enter. And so we've got our curve. And then I think like to add a little bit more detail, I just want to create another curve. So we'll add a second curve. And I like the way that this works because right now we've basically just cut our object in half using this curve. But now with this second curve, we can actually um, have it kind of intersect with our first one. So I'm going to template the first curve. Uh, I'll actually just show the first curve. And then with my second curve selected and my manipulator selected, I can kind of go opposite this a little bit to create sort of overlapping areas where it might cut apart my cloth in a slightly more interesting way. I'll hit enter and then I'm going to just merge these together. So I'm going to grab both of these and wire them into the merge. Holding shift, I just drag that up and then wire it into the edge fracture. And you can't really see anything, but if we go to the exploded view, you can see that, um, well, it is still fracturing all these other pieces, but we've got way more focus towards the center now. Now, I don't need any of these extra initial pieces, so I'm actually going to just untick this box. And you can see that all of our shredding or um, tearing is really focused in the middle like this, which is good. I mean, I think that like the next thing I'd want to do is just increase the resolution again. So let's go to point... Um, Let's do 0 0.025, and you can see we're really we really kind of get a more interesting uh, look out of that tear. But so now when we go back to our vellum object, I'm just gonna hit spacebar one to go back into my regular old view, and let's click play. So it's now starting to pull this cloth apart. It's starting to stretch and you can see the tears starting to form down here. 
And the thing that I like about having those slightly overlapping um, cutting curves is that you get these pieces that just sort of break off and go off on their own in the middle, which is kind of fun. So let's just, uh, I'm just going to rewind that a little bit and play it back so um, it's a little bit fat. Just play it back closer to real time. We get this nice tearing that occurs, which is really fun. Uh, one thing I'd like to do is maybe have it stretch a little bit more before it actually starts tearing. And the way that you can do that is just modify um, these welding constraints down here. We could actually change the, the breaking threshold to be something like uh, 0.2 instead of 0.1. And that would actually allow it to stretch further before it starts to break. So I'm just going to go back here and let's just uh, play this one down a little bit. See what we get. See how far apart uh, these pieces can get before they start to tear. Um, you know, obviously applying more stretch stress before it tears will kind of create more of a dramatic, stretchy, sort of elastic like tear, which can be, uh, which, which can be cool. And that's really fun. Um, if I play this back, you can see it really gets a, like a nice solid stretch before it starts to tear like that. Um, but one thing that I've noticed at this point is like we get this sort of jittering that's happening around our pieces, uh, uh, around our pieces of cloth as they're starting to come uh, detach from one another. And, you know, there might be a decent amount of that that could be fixed using the post processor. So if I just uh, hop up here and jump, I'm going to actually let's name this dot network the cloth tear and then jump in here to our our vellum export and um, I'm just gonna disable I'm gonna bypass the vellum IO and then we'll look at what we can do with post-processing and see if it cleans any of that up so this is uh, before uh, let's go back to where it starts to first starts to tear so we start to get like something like this happening which doesn't really make too much sense but if we turn post-processing on that kinda cleans it up but not really I mean that's looking pretty pretty weird. Um, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Uh, you could try and continue to smooth that out and you might get some good results with that. But I think that um, for this example, what worked for me was to just go into the um, into the vellum solver and just increase the number of sub steps. Now we don't, I don't quite need so many um, these, so many collision passes anymore. So I'm going to bring that back down to 10. Um, I don't think that that's going to really affect anything too much. So that should help actually the whole thing play back a little bit faster. It's simming much faster now. Um, but I want to just increase the number of sub steps. So under sub steps here, I'm just going to crank this up to like five. And then I'm going to pop over to my export and just uh, cache this out to disk. Again, I named this Vellum IO3 so that it's caching, it's not overwriting my other cache. So I'm just going to click save to disk and let that do its thing. All right, that's finished um, caching. Now if we um, just, uh, let's check it out. Click play, you can see it really builds up tension and then really snaps apart. Um, adding sub steps just makes it look so much nicer, I feel like, um, in general. But it can really dr drastically affect the look of your sim. So if that's really, it's, it's, it doesn't work in every case, but... I think that it did help um, smooth out some of these um, pieces as they're initially starting to break, um, making them not look so crazy. But then when we go in and we add our post-processing in, which uh, right now is just set to a spatial blur of 1 and a subdivision depth of 1, I'm just going to bring the spatial blur maybe down to 0.5 and then uh, play this back. Actually, I'll just uh, turn on smooth shaded and uh, so we can see that a little bit uh, better. Uh, maybe turn off the grid. So let's just see what we got here. So it stretches apart. You get a little bit of wrinkling here, which is kind of nice. And then these little holes begin to form, and then it snaps aggressively away from itself and ends up uh, looking pretty sweet. Cool. So um, you could do all sorts of post processing here. I mean, this you know at this point would be you know something you would then then you know cache it out to an Alembic cache file and bring it into Cinema or render it here or whatever you want to do, um, and you should be cool. Um, one more example that I wanted to cover uh, while we're in this just basic kind of example section is um, how to do a sort of custom target. Because we did some stuff with like pin constraints and stuff like that. But I found uh, a cool workflow um, 
to kind of get cloth to abstractly flow and do um, cool and interesting things is to kind of create your own custom targets for it to create forces to adhere to. So let's just do another setup here. I'm just going to grab all these and option drag it off to the side one more time. And we'll just jump in here to uh, the vellum export three. I'm going to rename this vellum I04. And it's, it doesn't have any data to grab, so it's going to yell until we figure it out. But what I want to do here is let's just create a new custom sort of uh, target for our, uh, a custom sort of shape for our cloth to vaguely try to adhere to by well, applying forces. So I'm going to turn off all this stuff. We don't need to do any more um, pinning or transformation, and we don't need to do any fracturing. So actually, I'll just grab all of these things and delete them. So all we're left with is our grid and our remesh, like so. So the next thing, this is what's going to go into Vellum. So this is going to be our starting shape. I'm just going to turn smooth wire shaded back on so I can see these, uh, these points. Um, then over here, I'm going to jump into the DOP network and we're going to call this cloth custom target. And I'm going to just jump in here and turn the substeps back down because this should be pretty simple. We don't need any additional substeps for this. I might just turn the wind down because we are going to be fighting. Our, our forces are going to be fighting with one another to sort of keep this thing into place. And I want to just keep it um, a little bit lower. So something like negative one should work. Amplitude, I'll just leave it where it is for right now. Maybe I'll uh, increase the pulse length to two. Um, so, uh, yeah, the pulse length basically just is the amount of animation that is occurring in the um, in this noise pattern. This pulse length is how quickly that animates. So let's create a custom target for us here. So what we could do is maybe branch uh, a little, we'll just branch a section off of this. So, uh, and what we'll do is we'll maybe transform it and uh, twist it and stuff like that. So let's throw down a twist. And we're just gonna um, we're just gonna twist this cloth about the z axis. So let's see. Um, the capture direction is set to z already. That's good. And so I should be able to just do a little bit of twist here. Yeah. So we're kind of twisting our cloth like this, which is cool. Um, the next thing I might do is add a little transform here. So we can actually have the cloth do a little bit of rotation as well. And you can really do whatever you want here. This is just for just for fun. Um, we want to rotate it along the, yeah, is that the Z axis? Yes. We want to rotate it along this axis. So the Z axis, I'm just going to put in uh, here, I'm going to put in, uh, at, at frame. So it should just have a little constant rotation occurring about that Z axis, which is cool. Again, these are all the points that are going to attract our other cloth. Um, so let's also put in a mountain. And because I'm putting in this mountain uh, before, uh, right after the transform, it's cool because this um, this this cloth is going to kind of swim through the mountain. You can see that the noise pattern is going to kind of change as that cloth is moving through. If I didn't want that, I could you know um, unwire the mountain and put it in right here, and you can see that the noise pattern stays constant as it rotates around. But I kind of like feel like something like this would work better if it was actually swimming and changing as, as, as the cloth moves through it. Um, but I'm going to turn off, I'm going to turn off the fractal of it. Uh, I don't need it to be super fractally. I'll just maybe change the element size to be a little, a little bit, um, a little bit lower. So a little bit higher frequency noise, and that can be sort of our floating cloth target. So I'll just, uh, annotate this by putting down a null and call this null our target. And because our target has the same topology, or the same number of points, if we middle mouse click here, 8,321 points on our target, 8,321 points on our input geometry, that means that it's very basic. We don't have to set up any IDs. It's just um, Houdini will know uh, which point corresponds to which point and what forces to apply to each point uh, 
based off of the fact that these two topologies are consistent. If they weren't, then you'd have to get a little bit trickier in, in, with how your setup is and how your data is flowing through your network. But for our purposes, we're in good shape. Everything's looking consistent, so we can now add a custom force. The way I like to do that is by using a uh, point VOP or a pop VOP. So let's go over to our network and throw down a pop VOP. And we'll just wire this into the middle. You can see here, this middle one is called particle forces. Over here, I wired my wind in over here to, it looks like post solve in this merge. Um, doesn't seem like it really matters where I wire this in, but for the sake of being um, kind of more organized, I'll just throw down another merge over here and then wire these two together because they're forces. I'll wire these two forces together into the merge and those are going into the particle forces the way that, um, maybe the way that we're supposed to. Um, so now in the pop VOP, on this pop VOP, now this is different from the VOPs that came in um, that we're doing over here. Like if we're in SOPs and we throw it on a particle, a point VOP, you can see we get four, these four inputs. Over here, we don't really have those four inputs. We get a big bar where we can wire anything into this. It's just like a merge. But with this one, um, we, we don't have that necessary so input. So if we wanted to, you know, inside of here, get something from one of our op inputs, like we want to, we want to actually wire target into one of our inputs, we actually have to specify that up over here in the input section. So there's a tab on this pop bop called inputs and we can just choose what we want from our second input. We could actually have the second input be um, one of the inputs um, but for our purposes we just want to input a SOP. And a SOP we can just point it to this target. So I'll just throw the target in there and now anything we pull out of this op input is going to be referring to that target and that means it can actually update as the simulation is running without having to add any additional solvers or anything like that. So now that we've got that going on, let's just jump in here and extract that position information from that second input. So I want a point attribute. Um, this is the import point attribute and what it looks like it's looking for is for a file. That file is our op input too. In fact, I, um, I could actually specify, I, I wouldn't even need to necessarily wire this in here. I could actually specify to bring it into our second input from our second input, so long as it was defined up here that our second input was this SOP path. So anyways, I'm going to wire in the file now because I find that to be easier for my brain to comprehend. I can actually see what's happening without actually having to click on the node and look at this input. So there we go. And the position we want to get is the attribute p which is cool so now we've got our p attribute for the actual sim geo we've got our p attribute for our target geo now we just need to create a force between the two and wire it into this force uh, we need to create a vector between the two and wire it into this force so we can just do that using vector subtraction so sort of on a subtract and just um we'll wire in the p first position and subtract the second position uh the position from our target and just wire that into the force. So now that is creating a vector that points um, along the uh, the position between the initial points and these target points. So let's just hop up here and see what that gets us. Click play. And to make it easier to see, I'm actually going to disable the wind and I'm gonna disable gravity as well. So I'm just gonna click play. And you can see that it's actually pushing these points all over the place and it's not really giving us what we want. And that's because I have the order of subtraction wrong. Um, so if I'm up here and we go to this initial, I'm just going to turn on cloth initial and have the target flag selected inside of it. Uh, so it's set to display so I can template this and hop out here and throw on ghost other objects. It actually looks like it's more or less repelling away from our target geometry. And that's just because the vector that we're calculating between the two geometries is reversed. So I just need to go in here on our subtract and reverse these inputs. So I'm gonna hit Shift R and that just wires them in in the opposite order. So now, instead of it being a repeller, these should be attracting. So if I go back into the top network, um, now we can see that we're getting this sort of force that is 
attracting this cloth into vaguely the shape that our target is. Um, the cool thing about this is that it isn't like a pin constraint where it's just being glued to our target. We get this sort of sort of morphing abstract um, cloth that is just kind of trying to adhere to this shape but not necessarily being like 100% locked into it either. Um, so if I turn this off, we can just kind of look at the motion of our cloth. So it's forces, just kind of dragging it towards that towards that um, geometry. Now you can get different results also by maybe wiring this into velocity. So instead of updating force, now we're updating the velocity vector of that geometry and it creates quite a different look as well. You can see that it's being attracted towards it, but it ends up being much more um, stable in the end. But it, what I've found doesn't really work well when you're mixing it with things like wind. So if I play this back, I mean, you are getting a little bit of motion from the wind, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it actually looks like it's adhering pretty well um, with also with having not only um, wind blowing at it, but also just seeking that target. And if we just ghost that target, you can see that it's that it's right there twisting around and the cloth is trying to adhere to it, but um, not 100% doing it because it's also mixing with other forces and it can just end up creating really cool effects and really, you know, um, controllable floaty cloth like animations are possible um, using this kind of a technique. So let's just wire this back into the um, into the force. And the other thing I wanted to do is just make it so that, I mean, this is a pretty much a static value um, that we've defined here. The only other thing I'd want to do is just make this easier to control out here by adding a parameter. So I'm going to throw down a parameter. And this is going to just multiply the power of this sort of force. So you can kind of mix it with your other forces and get it just the way you want it. Um, so I'll throw down a multiplier or a multiply. And we'll just wire this in here. And then our parameter, we're just going to name this our force multiplier. Oops, I want an underscore here on this name. Oops. And then down here on the label, I want to label it force multiplier. Malt, whatever. You can name it whatever you want. And we're just going to wire that into the, oops, I'm going to wire this into the second input. And so now up here on our VOP, we have a force multiplier. We can basically multiply, we can control from out here how much of an effect this uh, force is actually happening. And you can see right now that it's having no effect. This cloth is just whipping around based off of whatever noise pattern is in our um, whatever noise pattern is in our wind. Um, but if I crank this back up to one, you can see the cloth is starting to attract back towards that target that we set for it. So very cool stuff. With a lot of tweaking, you can get some really interesting cloth behavior. And a lot of these concepts actually apply to other areas of vellum as well, which we're going to cover a couple other um, examples using vellum. But really, these are sort of the core concepts. You've got your constraint iterations. You've got your um, solver substeps and stiffness parameters, bend parameters, and then just adding noises and stuff in to just create interesting cloth-like behavior. Pin constraints. So in the next lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of um, explore what we can do to on uh, up here. We've got a vellum balloon uh, preset, which is really fun to play with. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to inflate some objects inside of a shoe, a lot like the Air Max, the infamous or super famous Air Max 17 spot from a few years ago that um, I find to be one of my favorites of all time. So we're going to explore that next and stay tuned for that lesson.